Um, and I'm well, happy to welcome you to our fall series of uh, talks. We did an ambitious 23 or 24 uh, talks in the spring when we were um, trying to figure out what to do with our COVID selves. I don't think when we did that, we thought that we would be still doing this in the fall, but it turned out that it was actually, in some ways, a more accessible way to get together and have artist talks than um, having them in the gallery, which is what we were typically doing. I think it enables people to come from far and wide. So that's a wonderful thing. Um, it gives me great pleasure today to be able to uh, welcome you to this talk with Shani Mutu. Um, I want to say that um, I first uh, became aware of Shani's work 40 years uh, when I turned 40 for my Christmas that year in um, I think it was 1996. My friend Margot Lemelin gave me a book for Christmas called Serious Blooms at Night. And it was an absolutely wonderful gift. And she said, you've got to read this. This woman is a marvelous poet. And it was a, it was a fantastic book. And it sent me to the dictionary in the first paragraph. I think, um, if I'm not mistaken, Shani, it was the word for, another word for red, a uh, color of red, alazarin. And you sent me to the dictionary several times when I was reading your first book. And at the time, it was a wonderful way of, um, you know, escaping from my little rural Canadian village off to this very exotic smells and sounds and colors of this Caribbean island. And I have to say that um, all the way back there, it never occurred to me that you and I'd be living in virtually the same small village on another little island in Canada 25 years later and we'd be friends. So I'm right, very right. pleased that we've become friends over the course of time. And um, not only that, uh, have I continued to enjoy uh, reading the many books that you've produced over time. Uh, but now we're really pleased at the gallery to be able to exhibit the other side of your creative uh, energy. In addition to the books that have been written, uh, Shani is a very accomplished videographer, photographer, filmmaker, and her work has been shown, um, you know, from uh, here to the Venice Biennale. It's been exhibited in the United States and Europe um, and uh, Canada, of course. And uh, so it gives us great pleasure to have someone who's got so many uh, creative um, uh, paths that they have taken uh, here with us. So thank you very much for taking this time to share this hour with us, Shani. Um, thank you very I'm, much. I'm going to also just introduce if I and I'm also going to just introduce very briefly, if I may, uh, Dr. Jessica Vivers, who has joined you know, Gallery um, in this past summer as our new uh, uh, director. And um, uh, she was formerly, uh, she did her, her doctorate in um, uh, fine art at Concordia, and um, most recently was teaching at Concordia, teaching fine art. We're really pleased to have her joining us, and she is going to be our animator for this series of lunch talks and um, so thank you very much Jessica for joining us as well so um, with that I'm going to turn it over to you Jessica and Shani and um, enjoy the hour everyone thank you hi everyone uh, thank you for that introduction Carlin it is a fantastic pleasure to be here and uh, launch the first talk of the fall series with Shani Mutu. Um, she has some fantastic photography to share with us today. And uh, I'm really looking forward to the discussion that will ensue afterwards. Uh, I'll let Shani go ahead with the talk and, uh, and then uh, definitely, as Carlin said, if you have questions for her that come up as you're going, please put them in the chat bubble and we'll make sure to pose them at, at the end. Okay. Thanks a lot, Jessica, and thank you so much, Carlin, for that uh, that nice introduction. Um, I, I'm seeing many people on on the screen here whom I know, and uh, thank you so much for joining. It's really nice to see you all. Um, I'm going to give you a short tour through a few of the photographs in the exhibition here uh, at Eno Gallery. Um, I'll talk a little bit about my visual art and writing practices. Um, where they converge and how they differ. And I'll also do a short reading from my newest novel, Polar Vortex. 
uh, the best part of any uh, any um, you know of these um, kinds of uh, talks and so on, and uh, you know the festivals that I've been to for, for reading and so on, has always been connecting with the audience. And as you can ma can imagine, that's been really um, uh, very um, difficult. It's been a real challenge lately. So I'm going to leave time for questions and comments from you afterwards. So please uh, feel free to jot down anything you want to chat about, and Jessica will collect these. And um, I really look forward to that part. So an odd thing has recently happened. Although to me, my art and writing practices have been on two sides of the same coin, I'm usually accustomed to a separation of the two when they become public, as in exhibitions or festival readings and panels. And uh, just hang on one second. And well before the uh, the Scotiabank Gilla Prize long long list nomination, long before there was any talk of the Gilla, in fact. Carlin uh, Moulton at Eno Gallery had um, had planned that this current exhibition would take place at this very particular time. So what's happened as a result of having been placed on the Giller shortlist is that two arms of my creative practice are crossing, both thrown into the limelight at once. It's a strange thing for me. And Carlin, it's a bit of a dream come true the gallery's recognition and encouragement of these two parts allows an unusual and much appreciated feeling of wholeness for me. I'm also grateful to be able to share with all of you a few pieces of the work here and a bit about my creative practice in general. Um, many of us in this room, I am sure, uh, um, make art and write. And so I'm sure there are those of you um, who will know what I mean when I say that from young, I've engaged in some creative practice or the other, making and building things, inventing, photographing, collecting, you know, the, the, the ordinary things like stamps, bottle caps, matchboxes, coins, commemorative pins, etc. Daydreaming endlessly and reading books in Trinidad with stories that transported me through time and place and non-fiction or philosophical works too that were in the collection of our um, library in our house and works that as a child i couldn't possibly have understood but that put unusual combinations of words into my brain and mouth and which i then jotted down in what looked to me like poetry and this continues today but i engage now with more understanding with a more focused curiosity and more intention in my creativity. Let me tell you in the most condensed way a little about how I might decide to turn an idea into a painting instead of a poem, or what makes a, makes a photo, makes, makes me take a photograph, and what makes me enter into the process of writing a novel. I've, I've put the screen up here so that you so you can't see me, but we'll get to the photographs in a minute, okay? So over the years, I've come to realize that what becomes a long form writing uh, piece, written piece, like a novel, tends to be my attempts to sort out the logic, or rather the illogic of life through creating situations in which a few char characters must act or not act. My novels tend not to be plot driven, although it, it turned out that this last novel, Polar Vortex, does have a very strong narrative arc that surprised even me. But um, as I was saying, that um, I, my novels tend more to be idea driven than plot driven. What becomes a painting one uh, uh, on the more abstract side usually deals with a discussion through the act of painting itself of the materiality of painting by which i mean paint gesture mark surface etc paintings that fall on the side of realism address my need to know a thing a plant a ripple in the body of a water of water 
reflection um, to know these things more intimately. Spending, sorry, somebody's saying something? Oh, okay. Um, spending the slow time of painting then teaches me to see. I believe that is what translates in my writing into description, scene setting, and what has been called filmic in my writing. Now, getting down to photography, here I'm not talking about the tremendous pleasure of snapping images that I put on Instagram, but the kinds of images that I must pause, think about, and make photographic decisions about, return again and try again to, to accomplish that vision. I will say that there are, as is typical with many photographers, several uh, subject areas that interest me, aspects of what might be called, uh, uh, sorry, um, of what might be called landscape and nature, bodies of inland water, uh, and lately interiors of people's homes, their collections, that is, sort of the domestic, but as you will see, without people. Um, I'm not the kind of photographer who sets a stage or replaces a sky with one from another photograph or tries to create a mood in post-processing that was not there at the time of taking the photograph. In fact, the manner in which I make a photograph is very much about assuring me that what I saw is what was there, particularly in this day and age when truth and reality seem to be contentious and subjective. So let's start looking at the photographs and I'll try and elaborate what I'm saying through them. This first one, History Revisited. Last year in July, I went home to visit my father who lives in the house he and my mother had built for us when I was 10 years old. Four generations of Mutus have now put their marks on this house. Every time I returned home for a visit, and particularly since my mother passed away 10 years ago, I've been aware that the house is aging. A once fabulous piece of modern residential architecture is crumbling. Living in Canada, where my history is always in, in the present, in the present tense, I often miss my home in Trinidad, where my childhood remains intact in the concreteness of my childhood bedroom. The walls cracked from earthquakes over the years. The paint on the outside peeled and the concrete becoming moldy because mold creeping up on the, uh, 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 on the, on the walls because that is how it gets in the damp of the tropics. And when your mother isn't around, she passed away 10 years ago to make sure things um, are kept in, in, in good shape, you know, they just, it just falls apart. It is there in that house that I see myself, my roots. And I wanted to record the house that was there and the marks on it of lives lived before time takes it away forever. In making a photograph, as opposed to making a picture or taking a snapshot, I must put away the emotional and sentiment, sentimental attachment to the space and see it as a finished photograph before I even set up the camera. This will, with the three spaces visible, read to me like a text that can be looked at left to right and interpreted. Oh the objects in this photograph have almost not been curated. They are more, when I say almost, I mean they've not been created, curated for, um, for just right placement, for beauty, you know, that sort of thing. It's very um, quotidian. Um, they're more haphazardly placed than are the well-placed walls of the architecturally chic home I once knew. Look closely and you see the history of a family on the wall. In framed, in framed pictures within this photograph. Move in further and you'll see the present day of the man who still lives there. 
my father, his knickknacks and medicines collected on the low shelves. Step back again and it becomes a photograph with framing that mimics the first line, lines of a novel. And then as you read it, the final lines of the novel. This to my mind is a portrait of the life of a family, perhaps not unlike the portrait of a family painted say by Velasquez, except that the people have been walking in and out of the frame for decades while those walls stay in place. Powder bowl. This one is called Powder Bowl. I should tell you that um, history revisited, you can see it's 20 inches by 14 in, in, in inches in this particular um, edition. So Powder Bowl is the photograph of a crystal and silver bowl that belonged to my mother. It was once an actual container in which one would empty powder you know, say, say bought, bought, brought home, you empty it out of the ordinary packaging and put it into this, um, this very pretty little bowl and set it nicely on a grooming table. When my mother passed away, it became mine. And I filled it with bits of jewelry and pins and coins that I've collected, all of which are of sentimental value. The photograph is a still life, I brought it here to the space in which it is a new object and photographed it quite differently than had it been home on my mother's dresser where I would have left it sort of in situ and pho photographed the, the environment in which it was. Um, but it's more than a still life. In a sense, it is a self-portrait with reference to my mother, whom apparently I look like. I want to add here that I tend to turn to writing poetry, which is closest in my mind to photography, when I'm faced with a revelation whose expression eludes the photographic image and whose intensity can be killed in trying to flesh it out in stories or long explanations. Poetry is useful for me when longing and the futility of that longing creates a void that is actually palpable. I use the form of poetry to try and pull meaning and the impossibility of meaning into a single place. The form itself gives a kind of permission for those inherent impossibilities. I want to read you an excerpt of a poem that references this powder bowl and other items brought back home, uh, brought from back home in Trinidad to my home here in Canada. Powder Bowl and the poem do the same thing, but in different media. So I, I, last night I excerpted and abridged this poem and I've read it a few times to try to make sure that it sounds good, uh, you know, my work tends to be the kind of work that you read off the page. Um, so now I'm going to try to read this. I hope, I hope, um, <laughs> I hope I do a good job. Okay, so it's called, Where Are You Now? The little things to which one clings, cut crystal bowl, silver lid dented, tarnished, once cupped, your scented face, filled now with broken time, buttons, rudraksha seed, shell of limpet, beads, half a bangle, side of airing, inch of plumber's chain. And what of the pair of glossy time green terriers, yours since you were a child, wrapped in newspaper and transported hair? after you left us. From your dresser in Bel Air, La Romaine, to rest now atop mine, a universe away in the Bel Air of the county. Chipped ear, noses glisten black, ceramics thin, suck, answers the fingernail rap. I had rather hoped for the sound of my name. Everything, the veranda, the roof, 
the railing eventually breaks. On propitious days, I wear my inheritance. The watch you left me is your hand strapped on my wrist. The silver dinner bell sat. The silver dinner bell sits. The silver dinner bell, dinner bell will one day sit. Is it true we'll meet again? What if we do? Mightn't I rather just keep right on healing, glorifying, missing, eternally elusive you? This photograph is called Kavir's World. Again, made in my my uh, my childhood home, my parents' home uh, last year. So Kavira's world shows another aspect of this house that I grew up in. How a room that was once a very nice guest room with its own washroom that led out on um, to the pool, the furniture I once knew it to have to have long long removed now by a sibling who an artist and a fashion designer uses it as his studio again this space is not curated as such i did nothing to it that is i did not move around or remove anything in the room there remains to this house a physical structure a structure albeit that is falling apart but the usage of the house has changed so much that even as I returned there to try to capture an, an unmitigated sense of home and belonging that I don't fully have here in Canada, I find it alienating and unable to provide me the comfort I search for, even as I sit at the kitchen table and talk to my father or siblings. The mannequin in this photograph, it's a cold and alienating form. It's undressed plastic legs pushing me further away. The two strange beds, one that belonged once in the maid's room, make no sense to me. At the same time, there was no doubt in my mind when I saw this room as it was here on my, my last visit that, um, that this was a photograph. I became not a past resident of the house, but a person with a powerful camera in my hand and i saw the potential for for a photograph that was calling and far better as such than the room i remembered the framing of a photograph of another brother on his graduation from medical college on the left you can, you can see that on the left the top left of the photograph with the framing of a yellow artificial rose on the right on the dresser on the right they keep me focused on the photographic moment. The next photograph, Sharon's sunroom, that was that photograph was recently taken, just uh, just to make, perhaps a month ago or so. It's fourteen inches by twenty inches. I was at my printer, Mike Goddard's studio in Trenton. Mm -hmm. Working with him on these photos, when a client came in and needed his attention for a few minutes, Mike told me I should go explore the edges of his studio, which is attached to his mother's house. I came upon a room that immediately grabbed my interest. There was a glass sliding door to the room, but it was closed. I ran back in and asked Mike if I could enter the room and photograph. And he said, very graciously, go wherever you want and photograph whatever you want. This room, although thousands of miles away from my family's home back in Trinidad, reminded me of aspects of that home, of aspects of the way my father pulled things together. The passing of time told in stories through the collection and placement of items on the walls. I had my little but incredibly powerful Sony RX100 Mark IV with me and took not more than about four shots. This one did everything I wanted it to do, to show the person who put this room together, a woman I did not know and had not then met, had not yet then met. And yet here she was, 
portrayed through her collecting what she collected and how and where she placed and juxtaposed one item next to another. In a way, making a photograph that was itself an object, an object that contained within it all her objects, and which would be displayed like an item, just like any one of her items on a wall, was a kind of imitation, a kind of mirroring of her, a kind of dance with her. Now, if you look at this photograph, you will see that Sharon's placement of objects on the wall, they're not haphazard. Like my father's uh, on, on the shelves, you know, the medicines and so on, and the little um, um, items that are uh, given to him by medical, um, by, by pharmaceutical company reps. Um, this here, these here, there's, there's symmetry, there's patterning, there's color throughout, and you can see that whether Sharon was conscious of this or not, she was curating and turning this wall into a space that reflected a great deal about her. Now, the next two works, this one, David's World 2, and then David's World 1. So let's look at David's World 1 first. Um, they, th these two photographs, I'm just going to go back and show you again David's World 2 and David's World 1. Okay. They were taken in the home of my good friend David Morish. David is a visual artist whose art making practice has involved creating fictitious archives and museum collections. David's collections, however, are not only part of his artwork, but are now a part of his life and the decoration of his home. At the same time, in the arrangement of corners, this, this, like this corner here, and um, items on the table, on the floor, you can see to the right, right close up in the front of the photograph, on the right-hand side at the bottom, a row of paparazzi fo photographing the Pieta. Now, this photograph is 20 by 14 inches, and in the, rail, in the photograph in the gallery, you can see the Pieta really nicely. Um, so, so in the arrangement of all of these items, the skeleton hanging from the curtain rod, we see David, the artist at heart, decorating his home, not only with materials of his profession, but almost as a designer of space. In David's world too, in David's world too, the wall is a single display that could be broken up into discrete parts of great interest. Step back from this section of the house and, you, and, and, and you'll and you see this area, but you see it askance, and yet it is very much part of, a, of his home. I think these two photographs tell me a great deal more about the man David than a photograph of him posed uh, whether in this room or on his own, might have. It's worth noting that in these two photographs in particular, as well as in Sharon's sunroom to a lesser extent, we see the space of the home's owner treated like a set, like a staged set. I myself merely frame the photograph I'm about to take, and that is my only curation of the room. Portrait photography has been a practice ever since the origin of the camera in the early 1800s. And it's gone through a number of pieces. Ever since the camera became small enough and economically available to consumers, we've been overwhelmed by snapshots of family, friends, people on the street, in public spaces. And now there's the all pervasive overabundance of selfies. We've become so accustomed to the human form in visual representation, uh, starting with early documentary photographs like the, uh, Dorothea Lange's Portraits of Dust Bowl Americans, which when I look at those, I see the faces of her subjects, yes, but I'm more aware of the depression of the time, of poverty and social inequality which those those photographs were meant to speak about not and not necessarily about the individuals photographed in them 
and current advertising and print and visual media journalism have abundantly exploited the diversity of human uh, behavior in imagery that it is difficult i think to make a photograph of a person today that isn't already overburdened with meeting albeit now meaning that has become muddled because of its very over proliferation almost making the depth of a person in a photograph invisible and what remains now of portrait photography today i think is studio work meant to be exhibited on pamphlets or in boardrooms or as wedding photography often it's not reviews reduced i think to being a vehicle for the photographer to exhibit her skills with her camera and the craft and tricks of the genre and the ever evolving tools camera and lens technology and from lighting all the way down to smoothing out of flaws in post processing etc it is in other words to my mind about tool skills and not about the subject the person as a real being or even as the culminations of ideas and therefore the portrait is not much anymore about the person the art of the person the ideas of the person and forgive me but i think here of kosh while i greatly appreciate his photographs as extremely fine works of art of de the development of film and then actual darkroom printing on paper itself look hard as i might i've never been able to learn anything about his subjects themselves even you think of um of uh, um uh, winston churchill or picasso yes they're very much winston churchill and picasso but i've never been able to learn anything more than what had already been known about them through the status of their celebrity pre the cash photographs uh, another photographer concerned with photographing people and whose work I think about a great deal is Philip Lorca de Corsia, whose practice has been actually to set up elaborate photo shot, um, shoots that involve staff, for instance, lighting crew. Some of his so-called portraits are staged. I think of the fabulously staged portrait of the young boy making himself a sandwich in the kitchen. And the one of de Corsia's brother staged to look like someone in a cold apartment contemplating an empty fridge. His brother's face lit up by the perfectly placed but hidden flash inside the fridge. This is not a portrait of his brother to my mind, but a fictional stage set. A story we're being told. He's also set up remote flash lighting in Times Square in New York City, stood far from his unsuspecting passers and triggered the flash when he saw someone he wanted to shoot. Uh, of course, he's been sued by some of these people, one person in particular, but street portraiture in the old sense, but insistently offensive in its sneakiness. Yet, I love the works of these two photographers, but in terms of portraiture, I'd say it's Cindy Sherman's self-portraits that move me. Shimon dresses herself up in the guise of film characters and makes photos of herself actually in the pose of the characters as they appeared in a still or one particular film or another. In her photos, I don't see stage sets, but I, I find them revealing of the inner life and mind, the fantasies and desires of the photographed subject, who is, as I said, the photographer herself. In making David's World One and Two, I found myself contemplating stage setting by, by the homemaker and the stage setting by the photographer. And this contemplation instructs me now in how I move forward in these particular in this particular series. The final photograph I'll show you. Um, and these are just a few of the photographs in the show at, uh, at, at the gallery, is called Sharon. When my printer, Mike's mother, saw the photo of her sunroom, if you remember this one, um, she became very, sorry, she became very excited. Let me see if I can get this back here, yes. She became very excited and wanted to show me the rest of her house. 
She invited me to come back with all my equipment and to spend time photographing as I pleased. I took her up on her offer and saw why she asked me. I had in Sharon's sunroom captured something of her, her idea of herself, her passions, her dreams. She seems to have felt that I saw her and that even though she wasn't physically in the photo, all of her was there. When I returned to her house on her invitation, I took several other photos, this being one of them. This one is not in the exhibition, but it is one, one of my favorite photographs, which is a silly thing to say, because in a sense, the last photograph is always my favorite one. So our, uh, I'll open questions up to everyone uh, for now. And uh, does anyone have a, a question that's ready to go? Mm -hmm. If you'd like to uh, speak up, um, you can open up your mic. Or if you prefer to type it in the chat box, then I can read it out to Shani. Uh, if you can turn, um, if everyone can turn their cameras on now, and um, yeah, if you can wave. Do you have a question, Millie? Yeah, I, I do actually. It's a, a little bit of a comment too. Um, uh, I'm curious about these, the, the photographs. I, I think uh, the ones that you have of your family home, uh, you know something uh, of the story of of the objects that, and the space that they're in. Uh, when you're looking at a space like uh, uh, the most recent uh, one that you showed us, uh, it's uh, it's a beautifully curated space, and I'm wondering, you know, like, is it more about curating objects, or do or is there something about the the meaning of those objects for the owner of them? Um, I mean, sometimes it it seems that it's mostly about about putting objects that work together in a space, uh, uh, and you know, I can't really, I'm not really always sensing the personal connection. Right. Um, I, I guess I do because I'm in that space. Um, how to translate that into the photograph? I mean, it's basically I'm um, spectacle in a kind of a way. Now, in the photographs of my parents' home right now, um, I, um, I don't really know the objects that I'm seeing. That has changed over the 40 years. Those have changed over the 40 years. And what I see are the walls that I once knew. And most of the stuff inside of the, in, in the house now, are, um, uh, they're not new, but they're new to me. And what I find in David's photographs, perhaps because I know David a little bit, and perhaps because I've come to um, to recognize Sharon's fingerprint, as it were, her handprint, in what she is making, what she, how she's setting up her place, I do see them. But um, it's a good question. It's an ongoing practice, and over time, I'm sure I will. Um, I will. I'll also hone my my eye. Right now I go in, I see something, I, you know, I'm sort of a, attracted to it, perhaps because I myself am attracted to, I see, when I see things, I'm very, very conscious that someone chose that something and they put it in this particular place next to this other thing. So perhaps it's also about, um, about training, about me having trained myself to see the person. Yeah. Are you is your name Millie? Did I hear you called Millie? Yes. Yes, thank you very much for the question. I hope, I hope I've given some sort of answer. It's a I think it's a tough one to answer. It is. Mm -hmm. but thank you. Questions like that actually help me to um to hone my my thinking and my eyes and so on. So thank you. You did a beautiful interview on CBC's The Next Chapter with Sheila Rogers recently. Thank you. And 
in that you conveyed that all art is about discovery uh, and it doesn't have an agenda at the beginning. Um, so I'm wondering with your photography, what do you discover? And if there becomes an agenda, what you hope your viewer will then discover with you? Well, that, that, um, that follows uh, Millie's question nicely, actually. Um, I really don't start out with an agenda. It's, it's a strong, a strong, almost physical response uh, in, in, with the photographs to something that I've seen, as in Sharon's sunroom, which, um, you know, which I, uh, um, I didn't go there with the intention to take the photographs. When I went home to Trinidad, I did not go there with the intention to make um, make these kinds of photographs. Um, I've been working on a body of um, of landscape photographs, and when I arrived at the house, what I wanted to do was take pictures to remember this place. They were personal pictures I wanted to make or to make for my siblings, but. I saw photographs almost uh, removed from me. They were like scenes, and so um, that's what I that's what I took. Now, you know, I could be, I could be standing on the edge of a cliff, moving backwards with my camera to say, take something ahead of me, on the other side of the cliff. And I become so focused on what I'm seeing and what I'm and how I'm going to take it that I could fall off the cliff and not realize it. And I use that example because it has almost happened more than once or stepped into, you know, into the way of an oncoming vehicle or something because because I'm so focused on taking the picture that I saw. Now the difference for me bet between taking pictures and writing. It's, it's something that I, I um, actually tried very hard many, many years ago in the days when I was making visual art solely and not, uh, not really writing, was to not, put, not use words. It was to try not, what, it was to remove the words from my brain and try to move in a different way, using a different kind of language, um, sort of like intuition, perhaps. And to and that's one of the things that I do with the photography. If I start overthinking, and even in a situation like in Sharon's room, overthinking and looking at what would make a better framing and you know, um, and should I, which is a, a, akin to perhaps even moving objects in the space and fixing them to my liking, I would lose the photograph. Then it would have an agenda as it, as it is or a, a bigger agenda. The agenda, I suppose, that I obviously would have is to respond to that instinct, that urge, and to then take pleasure in creating the photograph first in the camera and then afterwards outside um, in post-processing and so on. Uh, even right down to the point of um, like, what paper do we use, which is a conversation that um, I have with Mike. And um, you know, Mike, Mike, uh, Mike will um, sharpen the photographs perhaps a little bit, or he will see something and say, um, you know, this hair could be, um, could be brought out a little bit more. So after I've done my own work, he comes in, he does a little bit, and then we talk about paper. He's very knowledgeable with paper. And by the time, by the time we've chosen the paper, it becomes an entirely different thing. You know, it has moved to become, oh, they, they're so beautiful on the paper. Yeah. I, I shouldn't be talking about my work as so beautiful, but actually I really like them. <laughs> So I wonder if do we have Shani, I, I have a question. I have a question. Um, 
one of the things that I'm finding um, almost uh, frustrating about presenting your photographs online is that there are so many tiny details in these photographs that I want to get closer to. It's almost as if we need to create a video of each photograph with a kind of slow zoom into different details that are there because there are text elements that are significant. Uh, my experience of those photographs changes quite a bit when I can get right up against them and start to say, well, what is that text on that wall? And it starts to make some difference to how I'm interpreting the work. Uh, it's, it's interesting to me that you've, you know, you've framed the work and there's some distance from this assemblage that's there but you've not chosen to zoom in, but it would be interesting to me to, to hear your thoughts on that. Well, you know, when I was, um, particularly when I was talking about David's World One, um, I can't, can't go back to it now, but you know, with the paparazzi at the bottom and they are, I pointed those out to you because I wasn't sure if on, on the screen of your computer at home, you would, you would see those things, but, and, even by just pointing them out to you, you, you don't really see them. They're so they're so cool, and um, the 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 particular the particular things that he has in the um, I'm sorry, something's coming up here. Um, I made you the presenter, the, Shani. What did you say? I made you the presenter again. If you want to share, oh, David. I see. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, so here you see the, the paparazzi at the bottom there. Um, I'm pointing at it, but on the right hand side, you see the um, the skunk. And now there are a couple of things. The, David's choice and placement are one thing. The actual collection of the items, the actual, the desiccated cat in the frame, the, um, the mummified cat on the left hand side. You can't really see those on the screen. There's that. But the other thing is the actual photographing of this. The, um, you know, these mirrorless uh, full frame cameras nowadays, they're so amazing that when you look at, say, the paparazzi on the right, you're also seeing the floor. You're seeing the pieta at the back there. You can't see that as it is here. But in the real photograph, you can see it. Um, I wished I had had and um, the ability um, to move in, zoom in to them uh, in this talk, or, you know, had uh, had thought to take uh, small uh, parts of the photograph and put them up on the screen, um, which is, I suppose, a way of saying, please come and see the show. But um, the other aspect is what size should I, make these photographs even in in um the actual works that go up on the walls uh, the wall of the gallery or the wall of a person's home um some of the works like the ones in my parents home like these uh, seem to me like they could be made really quite large you know like um perhaps Sorry? Christina, the screen isn't sharing at the moment. You have it on here, but it, it's not sharing for everyone. Oh, oh but that's okay. sorry. We all remember the photographs, so the descriptions are working, but... Um, um, you can't see that. No, it's not sharing at the oh, moment. Oh dear, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Don't worry about it. We, okay. we all remember what David's role right. was. Okay. So history revisited, for instance. Um, so can you take the screen back, please? So, yes. um, yeah, I, I think to myself, uh, you know, should these really be large? And at the same time, I think I like the idea of the pleasure of moving in and reading these um, like David's world and the last of um, the, the last one that I call Sharon. Um, I like the idea of um, of being of having to move in and run your eyes all over the entire um, photograph. That was a ramble, Carlin. Did it answer your question in any way? 
Yes, it did. Thank you. And and Dana has helpfully shared with people the link um, of the video that we did shoot of the exhibition if you're unable to attend in person. And there is a certain amount of that zooming in to get closer to those elements. But um, it, it really does uh, invite that kind of stepping in, stepping back dynamic interaction with the photograph. So I thank you for that. that David's world, for instance. Does anyone or, else or, have another question? I do. Sorry. Hello. Can you hear Hi, me? Elise. Hi. Yes. <laughs> um, hello, Shani. Hi. Um, I'm Alice, and um, I joined late, but I watched the entire presentation live on uh, Facebook, and then I reali realized that I, <laughs> I had a, a link uh, without having to register. So I'm happy to join. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I've been watching your photos with great interest because, and then you talk about the size. Uh, I noticed that these photos, to me, they are very intimate, actually, almost like a diary of your observation. And therefore, I think that the size is correct because it is about moving in and having a closer look for me. That's how I experience, uh, experience them. And I really appreciate your uh, connection to the text, uh, to, to, to your writings. And I'm almost wondering if it wouldn't be interesting to have um, a, a sort of a presentation. I really like your descriptions of your experience. So... And I miss that when I'm looking at the photo because they are very intimate encounters, aren't they? Yes, they are. Yes. So I'm wondering if uh, a, a, a printed text, another edition, or uh, something that the the viewer can also read along with you to share your intimacy in those objects. You know, so I'm just wondering if that is also another an addition that it, could it, happen for yeah, some it's reason. Not it's not something that is in the works right now, but um, it is a common practice of photographers um, to do that right now, uh, so that you can um, sort of um, read and excuse me, um, you know, and there is a. Uh, kind of a soft plan right now to include photographs in my poetry collection um, that is supposed to come out next year, but I have a feeling that it's not going to because of everything that's happening right now. But um, but I'm not, yeah. It, it, thanks, I'll put that forward. <laughs> Good idea, thank you very much. Um, Shani, yes. we're coming up to the end of the, the hour and some people may need to, to leave for things. Yes. I'd love, I'd love for you to do a short reading from Polar Vortex for us. And then right. for everyone that needs to leave, uh, you can. And for people who can stay, we can stay on for a bit longer and do a few more questions. Okay, so I'm just gonna start at the, the front of the book. A cream-colored kurta, the neck and cuffs of the long silk shirt trimmed in gold thread, a red dhoti, a cream and red turban edge, edged in gold, from which a long curtain of pearl-like beads hangs and covers his face. Around him, red draperies, a ceremonial canopy, Behind the canopy, walls decorated in red fabric. My eyes are lowered, focused on his cream slipper shoes, curled at the toes. He's standing on red flowers strewn on the red carpet. People hover about their backstairs. They're busy, busy organizing his life, but they don't pay him or us attention. There's a low table inside the canopy. No. Not a table, a bed. He takes my hand. We move toward the bed and lower ourselves onto it. We, we lie side by side, his arms across my chest. I worry people will see us like this. 
but I want him to lie on me. I am thrusting, thrusting my body. I plead, I want him. He's holding his penis. I take hold of it, can hardly breathe. My chest aches for the release of, no, not love, sex. Everything is red, his tongue, his penis, the palms of, his hand, of my hands, red, red, red. Someone draws back the hanging cloth of the canopy. I pull away just in time and get up off the bed. Drums are beaten with fury, cymbals clash, tremble and chatter. A rhythm red and violent draws near. His soon-to-be wife approaches, mummy-like, shrouded in flowering red and gold, marigold heads scattered ahead of her steps. I leave through a side, bo side door, looking behind me. He remains reclined, no evidence in sight of interrupted pleasure. That dream again. In it, I always want him so badly. I'm shaking from my waist down like a dog yanked off a human's leg. I wonder if I moved about in my sleep, if Alex has any idea of the kind of dream I had lying next to her. She's already left the bed and she's closed the door. That was considerate. She's able to navigate the house soundlessly. How does she do it? Whenever I try to shut the door quietly, the hinges squeak, the handle squawks, the lock hits the jam loudly. I must get out of bed. It's 7.56 a.m., much too late to put a stop to him visiting us. I have no choice now but to face him. But he'll be facing me too. I'm not the only culprit here. I must remember that. Odd that I'd slept in on this of all days, but not so odd, I suppose, that I'd have dreamt that I'd have dreamt of him. But this of all dreams? It's so quiet with the door closed. Funny, you can't hear a thing from the rest of the house, but you can hear a dog out on the street barking. And from outside the window behind the bed, a bird, at least I think it's a bird, scurrying along the metal eavesdrop. Could be a squirrel. A chipmunk, maybe? Or a mouse trying to get in from the cold? We're supposed to be fine with that. Supposed to expect that sort of thing, living in an old farmhouse on what is technically an island. I doubt I'll ever get used to critters wanting to share space with me. The desire I felt in the dream lingers in my body. Ripples of pleasure torture me. I'll think of Alex. I'll curl under the covers here for just, just a few minutes more and imagine who. Thank you. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you, Shani. Thanks a lot. I want to say thank, thank you, you so much, for, Shani. Uh, thank you for, uh, for, for staying and, and to you, Carolyn, and to Jessica and to everyone at the gallery. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Well, I really appreciate you sharing with us. Um, are there are there any pressing questions you'd like to pose to Shani before before we go? Oh hi, I just posted a question on the chat. Can you can you see that? Uh, is um, this in, in you? Yes. Uh, yes, Jake. Welcome from Texas. We can <laughs> we can see your question there. Okay. Okay. Uh, do you want to just pose it to Shani? Mm -hmm. Do you want to go ahead, Ying Yu, or would you like me to read it? Uh, yeah. Can you help me read it? Thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So Shani Ying Yu asks. Um, Dear Shani, as a photographer, do you have the inspiration idea first and then create a topic to take a series of pictures? Or like writing a book, you create a topic first and then go find inspiration. Uh, second, um, it just moved down on me here. Second, if I want to be a new photographer, 
um, like I want to take some photos on the street recording real life of people living under after COVID-19 period. Uh, Inyo is in Texas. Um, should I just take whatever in front of me or should I ask for random people's uh, permission? Um, I'll stop. I'll start with those two questions. Okay, so first of all, yeah, you know, so I, I, my, uh, my early training really was as a visual artist. Um, Yungi, where are you? Can you wave? Ah, hello. Okay. So, um, uh, thanks for these questions. Um, I, um, yeah, my early training um, in visual arts really took me in the direction of being more interested not in, in expressing what I already felt or knew, but in trying to uncover something new through the process of art making. So um, I, I don't really ever go, go, go into an individual project knowing, like, you know, even writing a novel, Novel writing, public publishing, sort of fell into my lap. I had not intended to be a writer. And I was actually asked by a publisher to write and to write for them. And I actually used um, a process. I mean, this was like in 1994. Uh, and I used a process that I learned in visual arts um, a, a performance piece. Uh, Jessica, you might remember who did this for performance piece um, with the uh, the directions: take an object, do something to it, do something to it. Was it Jasper Johns? Um, I, I think it might have been. But um, I, yeah, that is how I began to write the novel. It was basically I had I had a picture in my head of an old woman. I had no idea where she was going to go and or what was going to happen to her. And I basically did it like an art project. And um, that is in a kind of a way, the way I've, um, I've, I've approached all my novels. I, I know we are told to create plots and to, um, you know, to have, um, to, uh, to have an outline of what we're going to do. I, I can't do that. If I do that, I've already done the work and it dies. I would kill it if I did that. So, um, but but I think that there are many, many people, I see some of them here actually, who do work with, um, with uh, outlines and plots and um, that suits them. Now, your other question about photographing uh, people on the street. Um, it's it's an interesting question. I myself, I'm too shy to do it, but there are people who do it. You have to find your comfort level, level, and also your sense of what might be, you know, nice, ethical. And um, I, when I think of Philip de Corsia and those flashes just suddenly going off on people's faces without them ever knowing this was going to happen, and then without any interaction with these people their photographs going up in um, large, bigger than life size, in, um, in gallery, on gallery walls and so on. Ah, I don't know about that. And in fact, as I said, he was sued by one of, his, um, one of the people that he, whose image I want to say he stole. But um, that is a question also that you have to, uh, you have to um, think about both before you go onto the street and when you get onto the street, you know, should you ask someone, as soon as you ask, the, the scene changes, people pose or if, if they're willing and that may not be what you want, but you have to decide. And how do you get into it? You know, um, I, I have a, um, a relative who's a very, very well-known writer. And um, I, I remember him saying uh, to his nephew, who is another writer here in Canada, saying the way you begin to write and i'm saying this about photography you just begin you just do it you do it and there'll be many 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 failures there may be 
the first time maybe like wow this is amazing and that gives you a vision of of what you must then work towards because you know um beginner's luck or perhaps you just have to do it day after day um photography is incredibly it can be incredibly expensive it doesn't have to be a lot of artists are using cell phones but um the kind of photography that i like ends up being very expensive for me but it doesn't have to be i hope that gives you some answers thanks for all your questions thank you thank you so much thank you shani my pleasure uh, um, thank you for sharing that process, Shani. And, oh, the pleasure uh, is mine, and thank you very much for having me do it with you. Thank you. Absolutely wonderful. So it, it, thank you very, very much, Shani, so much.